Amen. You can open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, please. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse number 14. I just want to ask you a quick question before we get into the sermon. What you just sang there in that last verse, is it true? Did you mean it? I hope you thought about it when, when you sang it. O oh Lord, our God, our homes are thine forever. Did you mean that? Today we're going to preach about that a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 14. Now Paul, of course, refers to himself as the spiritual father of these people in many places, many times. And uh, no different here. In verse number 14 it says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. Now he's making a very plain statement. He just doesn't want them to have to pay for him to be there. He wants to be responsible for his own physical needs. And as Paul was known to do, he was a tent maker, so he would work a job and pay his way. He didn't want to be a financial burden to his spiritual children. And then he uses a very plain and logical illustration to make that point. He says, I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So if you would, let's bow our heads together. I'd like to pray, and then we'll move right into the sermon. Father, we ask quickly now, please bless this time. Would you please speak to our hearts and open our eyes? And Lord, as we sang just now and I want to reiterate it in prayer. Our homes are thine forever. And God, we don't want you to ever forsake us in the church, and we certainly don't want you to forsake us in our homes. Please, Father, would you teach us something we need to know this morning to make us better parents for our children. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The truth of this verse, as I've mentioned, is very straightforward. He is speaking directly about a financial situation. He says, I don't think it's right for the children to have to lay up for the parents. And it's, when he says children, mind you, the, the illustration is younger children. Whenever he uses that term, uh, the parents are the ones that should be paying for the children as they grow up. I want to focus in on that phrase there, just two little words, to lay up, lay up, lay up. He says, I, I don't want you guys have to make piles and piles of money for me as I come to town. Rather, I should be laying stuff up for you. I should have a savings account and so forth so that I can pay my way and not be a burden to you. I don't think it would hurt us just for a moment to remind moms and dads that we do need to be aware of our financial situation so that we're not a burden to our children later on in life. I don't think that's wrong to say. That's a, that's a proper thing to say. Now, I understand not everybody has the same opportunities financially. So I'm not trying to say that a, good requir or a requirement to be a good parent is that you have piles of money. That's not the case at all. But I do think that a mom and dad should be responsible with their money and at least make a plan so that they're not a burden, as, as, as much as they can be, not be a burden to their children later on. Uh, I, I realize that I think all of us would like to be able to leave behind some money for our children when we're done on this earth. Yes? Maybe you're of the mind that what did they do for it? I worked for it. I'll use it while I'm here, right? And let them sort it out later. Uh, Sam Jones, who was a famous evangelist a couple centuries ago, he had this to say about leaving an inheritance for children. He said, if the child is no good, then the inheritance, the money, will just ruin him. And he said, if the child is any good, he won't need it. Now, there's a lot of wisdom in that. As I, boy, moms and dads like that one. Like, yes, yes, that's exactly. We got good kids. They don't need anything. I, I think we need to approach that subject with balance, right? Let, let's be responsible. Let us not waste away our children's potential inheritance with silly frivolities of life and, and, and sinful habits. Let's, let's try to be balanced and responsible when it comes to laying up a physical and secular treasure, right? They may not, you don't need to have piles of money in order to be a good parent, but 
There are some piles that you need to have, I believe, to be a good parent. Not piles of money, but I'm going to preach for a few minutes about the piles of parenthood. The piles of parenthood. There's some things you need to just stack up. You need to have a, a, a reserve of these things. And the first thing I want to talk about is you need to have piles, not one, multiple piles of good examples of godly living. Good examples, good pictures of godly living. In chapter 13 and verse number 4, if you would allow me today, I'm just going to pick through the scriptures here to back up my points. In verse 4, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. Speaking, of course, of the resurrection. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him, with Christ, by the power of God toward you. Paul says I, we are going to live a godly and a powerful life, a spirit-filled life, and we're going to do it toward you, Corinthians. We want you to be able to see the power of God working in our lives. You know, the old adage, and I think all of you are familiar with this, too many parents, I believe their philosophy of parenthood is this adage, do as I say, not as I do. That's an old adage, there's truth to it, but bless your heart, I hope you don't try to raise your kids with that philosophy. There's another adage, I think, that goes right along with this subject, actions speak louder than words. And if you would allow me to put another adage into this, another old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. If actions speak louder than words, and a picture is worth a thousand words, we need a picture with action. We need a motion picture. <laughs> I don't think it's any secret that kids like television. They like pictures. But boy, motion pictures really get the job done. I'm not preaching against television. I don't think it's a sin if your children watch a cartoon or a program. Now, mind you, there are some boundaries to that even. Moms, dads, please be careful of those things. But I, I hope it's not true today that SpongeBob SquarePants is the moral voice for your children. I hope they're not learning ethics and character and virtue from Scooby-Doo. Moms and dads, you should be providing a pile, a pile of godly examples for your children to see. Not just hearing you talk about Christianity, but watching you live it on a daily basis. You need to be the motion picture that captivates your children's attention and sticks in their mind until their older days. The Bible says to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it because you have burned into his memory or her memory that motion picture of what a real godly person should be. Let me ask you, moms and dads, do your children know that you pray? I'm not saying that you need to purposely squat down in front of them to pray. Although some of you would do well, right, to the child sitting here, the TV's over here. You, you just, put, just get down right and you'll have their attention, right? <laughs> do your children know that you pray? Do they know that you read the Bible? Do they ever hear you talk about it? I wonder if your children hear you tell more dirty jokes than Bible verses. I wonder if you've taught your children more cuss words than Bible verses. Do you ever sit around as a family and talk about winning souls? Do your children know that you're concerned about the salvation of the people around you? Wouldn't it be wonderful to sit around and have a family altar time where you as a family talk about how you're going to minister to some other family? Where your children would see that Ma and Pa is broken hearted about somebody else near them that's suffering. I feel as if when it comes to this, I've been a bit of a failure myself. So many opportunities have passed me by. Times when the world just gave me the best it had and I mean really beat me down. And I got frustrated and angry with the world. And when I came home, instead of my children seeing a dad that would pray about those problems, 
All they heard was a dad that would complain about those problems. And I see now how many opportunities I missed to show them what a godly man should be. And the only thing I can say is that I wasn't a godly man. How many times my children have seen me frustrated instead of filled with joy. How many times they've heard me complain instead of sing the praises of God in my home. I really wish that I could have given my children, and I'm trying to give my children, the godly example, piles and piles of memories where they said, boy, I, my dad wasn't perfect, but I tell you what, I could tell he loved God. I've told you many times before, this is my favorite missionary, John Patton, late 1800s, he died in the early 1900s. Oh, if you ever get your hands on this book, I would recommend highly that you read it. There's only a few books that I've read multiple times in my life. The Bible is one, and this one. I've read this multiple times. If you would indulge me just for a moment, I can't help but read just a small excerpt from this man's life. John Patton was a wonderful missionary in the South Sea Islands, preaching to cannibals. When he arrived on the island of Aniwa, there wasn't one Christian. When he left, there wasn't one heathen. This man had the power of God all over him. And he tells you in the book where he, where he first learned that. Speaking about his father, and specifically his father's prayer closet. He said, this was the sanctuary of that cottage home. Thither daily and oftentimes a day, generally after each meal, we saw our father retire and shut to the door. And we children got to understand by a sort of spiritual instinct, for the thing was too sacred to be talked about, that prayers were being poured out there for us as of old by the high priest within the veil of the most holy place. We occasionally heard the pathetic echoes of a trembling voice pleading, pleading as if for life. And we learned to slip out and in past that door on tiptoe, not to disturb the holy colloquy, which is a divine meeting. The outside world might not know, but we knew whence came that happy light as of a newborn smile that always was dawning on my father's face. It was a reflection from the divine presence in the consciousness of which he lived. Never in temple or cathedral, on mountain or in glen, can I hope to feel that the Lord God is more near more visibly walking and talking with men than under that humble cottage roof of thatch and oaken wattles. Though everything else in religion were by some unthinkable catastrophe to be swept out of memory or blotted from my understanding, my soul would wander back to those early scenes and shut itself up once again in that sanctuary closet and hearing still the echoes of those cries to God would hurl back all doubt with the victorious appeal, he walked with God, why may not I? John Patton grew up in a home where he had piles and piles and piles of godly examples. And even as an older man, as he wrote this book, he remembered that it was his dad that started him on the right path. And constantly made him thought, if my dad could walk with God, why may not I? At the age of 17, John Patton's father began holding family devotions. Now bear in mind, he raised his children going to church. His mother, or the, John Patton's mother, was in very poor health. She couldn't make it to church. So the family would travel over an hour one way to get to church on Sunday morning. And the dad would ride home and come home and he would perform the Sunday evening service in his home, telling his wife and using his children to reenact the sermon, saying, uh, John, tell me what the pastor said here, and, and you tell me what the pastor said next, and they would re-preach the sermon for mom. At the age of 17, John Patton's dad de decided that he's going to hold family devotions every day. And again, if I can... Please read just a little bit. This the more readily, as he himself agreed to take part regularly in the same, and so relieve the old warrior of what might have proved for him too arduous spiritual toils. In other words, he didn't want to make the pastor do it all. 
The dad was going to be a spiritual leader. And so began in his 17th year that blessed custom of family prayer, morning and evening, which my father practiced probably without one single, single avoidable omission till he lay on his deathbed. 77 years of age. When even to the last day of his life, a portion of scripture was read and his voice was heard softly joining in the psalm. They would sing together every day as a family falling in sweet benediction on the heads of all his children, far away, many of them all over the earth, but all meeting him there at the throne of grace. Even after his children left home, this man of God, never a preacher, never a missionary, but not a day went by he didn't read the Bible and pray and sing with his family. None of us can remember that any day ever passed unhallowed thus. Listen, please, please listen. No hurry for market. No rush to business. No arrival of friends or guests. No trouble or sorrow. No joy or excitement ever prevented at least our kneeling around the family altar. While the high priest, speaking of his dad, led our prayers to God and offered himself and his children there. And blessed to others as well as to ourselves was the light of such Example, oh, listen to this story. I have heard that in long after years, the worst woman, woman in the village uh, of uh, Thorthawald, or Tortawald, I think it is, leading an immoral life, but since changed by the grace of God, was known to declare that the only thing that kept her from despair and from hell of suicide was when in the dark winter nights, she crept close underneath my father's window and heard him pleading in family worship that God would convert the sinner from the air of his wicked ways and polish him as a jewel for the Redeemer's crown. I felt, said she, that I was a burden on that good man's heart and I knew that God would not disappoint him. That thought kept me out of hell and at least led me to the only Savior the worst woman in town would crawl next to this man's house to hear him pray. And that's how she got saved. Piles and piles and piles of godly living, of godly examples. Mom, Dad, have you treasured up, have you laid up any good examples for the kids? In chapter 12 and verse number 12, there's another thing, another pile we need to make. Chapter 12 and verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now obviously he's speaking of his ministry. But notice the first thing he mentioned, all patience. You need piles of godly examples, but you also need piles and piles and multiple piles of patience. Those of you that are not parents yet, would you just take it by faith that you're going to need lots of patience? Those of you that are parents, would you please help me with somewhat of an amen or a hand wave? Or Don't you need a little bit of patience? Well, some of them do. Others of you need to have some kids, and then you'll really shout amen. <laughs> Can I say that you need to have at least two piles of patience, one for your children and one for yourself? Your kids will test your patience, sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose. You'll need a massive pile of patience to deal with them. But you also need to have some patience with yourself because there's not one parent on the planet that has it figured out. I thought I did. I thought I had it figured out and then I had kids. And the older they got, the more I realized I don't have it figured out. It's very easy to get discouraged when you love your kids more than words can express and you want to be a good dad. You want to be a good mom. But you, mom, you, dad, we are learning as we go, and therefore you, you need to have some patience with yourself. But obviously you'll need patience with the children. Why? Because you cannot, listen to this, 
You cannot force people to be righteous. You cannot force people to be righteous, no matter what their age is. Seven or 70. You cannot force people to be righteous. You can force people to outwardly conform. You can make them do a righteous thing. But in order to be righteous, that is a matter of the will. And therefore, moms and dads, we must follow the example of God. Not even God can force someone to be righteous. Each individual must choose. What does God do? Jesus told us in John chapter 6, He draws us, He teaches us, He leads us, He guides us, He gives us all the material we need, and then we can make the right choice to say, Father, I submit to You. The Father teaches, the Father trains, the Father explains. Moms and dads, we need to pile up these lessons for our children. Teach them how to be honest from a young age. Teach them the importance of honesty. Teach them how to have respect for authority. For anybody in authority over them. It starts with you, mom and dad. You're the authority in their life. This will translate to how they treat their children, or their uh, teachers, rather. Next, it will translate to how they treat their boss. For the young ladies, it will translate to how they treat their husbands later in life. And, and this, this, these foundations that you're building in their younger days is going to carry on until they're old. And if you don't lay a good foundation, your child is going to struggle. Teach them how to be honest, how to have respect. Teach them how to have good priorities. Teach them that life is not all fun and games. It, there, there should be fun and games, but it's not all fun and games. Teach your children to have a good work ethic. Teach them how to do a job and do it right. Start them young learning these things. Teach them when it's okay to cry. It's not always right to cry. You, listen, if they're crying, I, I don't necessarily say, uh, turn them over, give them a good hiding, say stop crying because, well, now you're perpetuating the cycle. <laughs> but you can say, booty, this isn't the right time to cry. You don't need to cry about this. There are some right times to cry. You know why I know, how I know parents fail to teach this? Because we have 30 and 40 and 50 year old people that don't know when it's right to cry. And they just cry and cry and cry and they just never stop. Teach them when it's right. When is the right time to complain? It's okay to say, I'm hot. I'm too cold. I'm hungry. Those aren't... That, that, that's not a bad complaint. That's just an honest admission. But then to sit there and whine. Put a stop to that, mom and dad. Teach them when it's okay to speak. My generation, when I was being raised, I was on the cusp of this little tradition. I don't know if it's still appropriate. You, you moms and dads, help me out. Children should be seen, not heard. It, it, is, that, is that a familiar thing? right? That, that's tantamount to child abuse nowadays. But a child from a young age should not run up to every conversation and interrupt two adults speaking. And they're not going to learn that naturally, mom and dad. You have, to te you have to teach them. Teach them when it's okay to be afraid. Otherwise, they grow up and they're scared of everything, paralyzed by life. Moms, dads, it's your responsibility to teach them these things. Train them up in the way they should go. Listen now. But your child one day will have to decide whether or not they're going to follow your example. There is only so much you can do. I say give it your all. But even after you've done all you can do, the child still has to make that decision to apply what you've taught them. And this is where the pile of patience needs to grow. Because chances are, you're going to teach them how to do some things and they're not going to listen and it's going to break your heart. Do you remember moms and dads when your children were young and you taught them how to walk? Taught them how to talk? You remember that? We take months teaching them to walk and talk, and then we take years telling them to sit down and shut up. <laughs> Isn't that strange? Just how life goes. Come on, booty. Talk, talk, talk. I shut up, booty. Sit down. <laughs> it's how it goes. 
But you know, at first you, you go two-handed with them, you know, and you walk them and it's so exciting and those chubby little legs are wobbly and just... <laughs> they can only go as fast as you can drag them. And then a little bit later, you know, patiently, right? You don't just plop them up on two legs and say, now run the 40 meter. <laughs> you hold on and then eventually you have to let go with one hand and you, they still need you for balance. They don't know how to balance everything. You've got to teach them that. And then they walk along and then one day you take the hand off and you know how moms and dads are. Boy, we're watching over. Oh, as soon as they start to stumble, we're right in on that. Moms and dads, we never stop worrying. Our children can be 30 or 40 years old and we're still wondering, are they okay? Are they stumbling in life? Remember the first time your son or your daughter came to you with a scuffed up knee? Or, or, or fell and scraped their elbow or hit their head? You remember how panicked you were? You're ready to call the ambulance. Good grief, it didn't even break the skin. <laughs> But he might have broke his leg, you know, the way we think, you know, oh dear. We're so concerned. We're teaching our children how to talk. You know, it takes time for them to figure that out. That's one of the funnest things to do is listen to a, a child who's learning how to talk to try to pronounce those words. Amy, she struggled for the longest time with the word yellow. She couldn't say yellow. It was always lello. <laughs> this is pretty lello. That was just awesome. And she didn't know her name for a long time. She, would, she thought her name was Mamie, with an M in the front. I'm Mamie. So everything was Mamie, 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 until she was about six, I think. And then we, no, no, Amy, she got it figured out. Caleb as well, now, he struggled when, when, he, was, when he was young, 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 just learning how to talk. He could not pronounce Megan, his, of course, older sister. He couldn't pronounce Megan. So the name came out, and I don't know why, it came out Gogo. <laughs> So his older sister was his grandmother, <laughs> which is very strange. Don't know how that happened. But you know what? Eventually they figured it out. Eventually they got it figured out. But after they get up and off they go, they don't just walk, they run. They don't just talk, man, they talk. <laughs> but then you're wondering, where are they walking to? Who are they talking to? What are they saying? You might have to watch your children grow up and fall. Or be influenced by the wrong people and you know, you know that the people they're hanging around with is going to hurt them. You're going to have to watch them make some mistakes that they'll regret for the rest of their lives. And you've done all you can do. And you're going to have to take the position of the prodigal dad we studied the prodigal son and his older brother last week. you remember that? But let us not forget that that father of the prodigal son, how many days and weeks and months and maybe even years do you think he waited and waited and waited for his lost son to come home? What could he do? Wait. You're going to have to have piles and piles of patience. And, and listen, folks, you, mom's dad, stay humble enough so that when you realize you've made a mistake as a parent, you can admit it, you can apologize to your children and say, I've, I'm sorry that I did it that way. I wasn't trying to do it wrong, but I get it now and I'm learning. Please know that I love you. That I, don't want, I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better mom. Stay humble enough to learn and to make the changes you need to make. But I know this, one of the greatest ways to manifest your love is through your patience. When we read about charity or love in 1 Corinthians 13, the first description in the list, it says, charity suffereth long. It is long-suffering. It's patient. You need piles of patience. And, and that verse actually transitions me into the next thing I want to say, another pile. Piles of godly examples, piles of patience. You need piles of love. Say, so, Brother Mike, where am I going to find the patience that I need? I, I'm trying to teach my child the right thing and they're just not getting it and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. I'm going to tell you the patience will be equivalent to your love. In chapter 12 and verse number 15, 
very close to where we started. He talks about laying up for the children. And in verse 15, he says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Now Paul's speaking as a pastor here. And he says, I'll do anything for you folks. Anything that it costs me to help you, I'll do it because I love you. And if you don't reciprocate that love, I'm still going to love you. I'll love you even more. It'll break my heart, but I'll love you even more. Where are you going to find the necessary encouragement, strength, hope, patience? You're going to find it in how much you love those kids. Say, Brother Mike, this is obvious. Any mom and dad knows how to love their kids. Then you answer me this. Why in Titus chapter 2 does it say that the older women should teach the younger women how to love their kids and love their husbands? Yes, it comes naturally. But it's very difficult to explain if, you're not, if you haven't gone through it. How a child can test your love. You know, some parents try to buy the love of their children. Rather than be the mom and dad they need to be, they just throw money at it. They try to give the child everything the child wants, and in so doing, you've ruined the child. Some moms and dads go the other direction. And they try to beat their love into that child. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And sometimes a mom or a dad who has good intentions gets a hold of that verse and says, I'll prove my love for that child. I'll show them how much I love them. But you don't realize, mom, dad, you become nothing more than a referee to that child. And you seemingly follow them around just waiting for them to mess up. And the only thing they ever hear coming from your mouth is a criticism and never a compliment. The only time they ever experience the touch of your hand is when you're hitting them and not holding them and hugging them. Is there a place to buy your children something, to provide for them? Absolutely. Is there a time that you need to give them an appropriate hiding? Yes. But that should not be the extent of your parenting. Let me tell you, you can try to buy it, buy the love, you can try to beat the love in there, let me put one more thing in here. How about you love them by doing this? Just be there. Don't just say this. Live this. Say, child, I love you so much that no matter what you do, what decision you make, no matter how far off the path you might get, my love is always available for you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I may have to change the way I manifest my love, but my love is always there for you. I will be there for you. I say, Brother Mike, where do you learn about that? Well, I think the Apostle Paul helps us a lot here, doesn't he? In verse number 14, he says, Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you. This is now the third time he has to go visit these Corinthians and help them get straightened out. Do you know anything about the Corinthian people? They were hard-headed. They were rebellious. They were difficult. And Paul said, I love you folks so much, I'll come not just once, not just twice. If I need to, I'll come around a third time. I'm there for you. You know what? These Corinthians were saying ugly... Listen, you children in here, listen to this. The Corinthians were saying ugly things about Paul. Don't you know that hurt him? But Paul, being more spiritually mature, rather than just getting angry about it, he says, you may love me less, but that just makes me love you more. You, you know where Paul found this ability to love people? He learned it from how God loved him. Does God provide for us? Does God give us a lekker pox law when we need it? But you know, beyond all of that, beyond all of that, there's something God provides for us that we find nowhere else. And he says, I'm there for you. 
I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God is right there for me. I want to make a statement, and please let this sink in. You can have as much of the love of God as you want. Isn't that true? The only limit to how much you enjoy the love of God is you. God says, you want to know me more? You want to spend more time with me? You want my advice and my counsel? Do you want my companionship and fellowship in your life? Have as much of it as you want. Once you get the proper perspective of how God treats us, father to child, moms and dads, it will only make you a better parent. Because then you'll learn that's how a father is supposed to love his child. Now let me show my children that same kind of love. Even if they break my heart, I'm going to be there for them. I'll never stop loving them and I'll never stop showing it one way or the other. This leads me to the last pile. And you can see how this would flow We need patience. I believe our patience will be piled up out of love. But I believe our love for our children will be piled up from this. And forgive me, this may not be great English, but you need piles of God. Not God's. (laughs) Piles of God. What do I mean by that? You need to get to know God more and more and more. To grow exceedingly in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you grow and know God more, know Him better, I promise you it's going to make you a better parent. I've seen that every time in my life that I have grown and got to know God better, my ability as a dad has improved. You know what that does for me? It makes me... Now listen, this isn't my only motivation, but it is motivation. Right? It's not my chief motivation, but it is motivation. I want to know God better so I can be a better dad. Do you understand? That's not, I, I, don't, I don't live just for my kids. But I am very interested in being a better dad. And the way to do that is to be a better Christian. And the way to do that is to know God better. To know Him in a closer and more intimate way. I feel so... I think Yala... You guys say hartseer? That's not a very American thing to say. Now our hearts get sore, but we don't say it like that. But I think it's a very good phrase. Hartseer. My heart is by a seer. Then only, only in my later days am I figuring out all these things I should have done differently as a dad. Would you guys in your 20s that yet you've yet to start your family, would you please, would you please look up here and see a man that wish, wishes he would have heard this sermon at your age? I'm telling you, the deeper in love you fall with God, the deeper in love you'll fall with your children because you will know on such a personal and intimate basis how someone like him could love someone like you and then as you look at your kids and you'll see their imperfections you'll see what they all the areas in which they struggle you will be able to deal with them so patiently and so lovingly because you'll know that's how God deals with you I I don't think that any mom and dad in here would deny this don't you want your children to come to you and say, Mom, Dad, I, I love you. I, I seek your advice. I like spending time with you. One of the most difficult things there is, you know, when, when the kids are young, they come up, they want time, right? Daddy, 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 Daddy. They want that personal time. Sit on your lap, give you a hug, kiss you goodnight. Oh, yes. And then in a certain stage, it's Daddy, Daddy. It's no longer daddy, daddy, it's dad. Dad, stop. Don't hug me in front of my friends. Stupid. 
as a parent, I know how it feels to yearn for those days when your children wanted to spend time with you. When they came to you with question after question after question. Daddy, how does this work? Daddy, why do we do this? Daddy, this? Daddy, that? Daddy, that? Oh, don't get frustrated. Enjoy. Soak those moments in. Because there'll come a day when you will beg God, please let my child see how much I love them. I understand. I get it. I have one that's married and out of the house. I have another that's in university and working his way into adulthood. I have learned in a small way how difficult it is to back off and let go and take my hand off and let him run. Oh, that's not easy. You're so proud of them. So proud of them. And you love them so much you just didn't know that your heart could feel like that. And that's where the heart seer comes in. It had to have been a parent who made that word up. It had to have been. And, and, and you, want your, you, want, you want to see that child just go on and and do right and get close to God. You say, how can I as a mom or a dad affect that situation? Start now. Start now piling up godly examples, piling up patience, piling up the God kind of love. And the only way to do that, mom and dad, is for you to get as close to God as you can be. We don't need good parents. We need godly parents. We need godly parents. Help us today. We need to lay up for our children. That's fitting. That's proper. The parents should lay up, pile it up for their children. Let's all stand if you would, please. Caleb is going to play something quietly. I'm going to allow you families to work this out amongst yourselves. I'm going to ask my family to come forward. I'd like to pray with them up here at the altar. Now that's me. You don't have to do that. But I'd like to give you the opportunity. If you have your family here, what if you were to huddle around right now and spend some time in prayer just where you're at? Husbands, wives, what if you were to get together just now and say, God, help us to be godly parents. You take a moment. You sort this out. You obey the Holy Ghost.
We're going to give these families a little bit of time. What a wonderful thing to see them praying. Moms, dads, please don't let it be a once-off thing in the church. Please take it home and implement it. Start piling up that godly example. But it's going to require that it's genuine. You can't just go through the motions. You're going to have to personally yourself fall in love with God. Before we close, let me just remind you that if you you are that prodigal son, maybe you have been out in the far country of sin, God in heaven patiently waits for you to come home. His love is waiting for you. And if you'll come to Jesus Christ today, all is forgiven. But please know that the love is available. Father, thank you for how you've moved amongst us today. Lord, as we sang at the beginning of this service, our homes are thine forever. Give us homes built firm upon the Savior. Father, would you please help us as moms and dads draw us closer to you so that we can train up our children in the way they should go. Help us to keep learning, Lord. Please continue to teach me. I want to know more. Father, perchance someone here today is not saved. Lord, would you open their eyes and let them see that you eagerly await their repentance. Father, thank you for a good service, but... This needs to continue on in our homes, not just today, but throughout the week and months and years ahead. Please, Lord, remind us. Bring these things to remembrance as we need them. We do pray that you'd bring us back safely tonight. Lord, we want to hear more from you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.